Hey everybody, Cybertail back at you with all things chess. Uh, we're going to continue our look at the life and times and games of Yevgeny Sveshnikov. Um, I put out my first tribute examination of his yesterday, so go take a look at that. Um, yesterday we looked at the Sveshnikov Sasin, which is really what he's going to be most known for. Um, in my opinion, uh, the work he did on the the Sicilian, the Sveshnikov Sasin, which was once called the Lasker Pelikan, and uh, in Russia is called the Chelyabinsk. Um, in my opinion, his work on the another couple of lines might even be more foundational. Uh, it's just the happenstance that those lines haven't haven't have, have not happened to become as popular as the Sveshnikov Sicilian. But uh, his work on the C three Sicilian, and this is the game that we're going to look at today. Uh, in my opinion, is more foundational and more substantial than his work on the Sveshnikov. Because really, he was going at the, this alone. Uh, there were a few other people playing the C3 Sicilian at the time, but no one put in the same level of theoretical work. This was really him coming up with whole parts of modern chess theory all, out, all by his lonesome, all out of his head. It was just incredible work by him. Um... In my, in my opinion, it, this is generally just called the C3 Sicilian, doesn't really have a name. It could easily be called the Sveshnikov Sicilian, and deservedly so. He did this work by himself. It was incredibly substantial and foundational work. Um, it's different from the main line of the Sicilian. So the main line of the Sicilian, knight of three, then I, on either d6, e6, or knight c6, let's just say e6, d4. So the difference is, we're preparing d4 first... Because the downside of playing d4 immediately is that you give black two central pawns against one. So there's a chance that later black will be able to attack the center effectively because he has that extra central pawn. So white prepares d4 with c3 so he's not down the extra central pawn. Um, that's the positional justification. Now, what are the downsides? The downside is this knight on, the queen knight doesn't really have a good square anymore. That's why in a lot of these lines you'll see this knight coming to a3 so it can jump to either b5 or c4. Um, another downside, typically in the open Sicilian, white is just developing very quickly and he gets a lead in development. Um, here, white doesn't get that lead in development because he's moving his pawns a lot more than otherwise. Um, in my opinion, it's worth it. The c3 Sicilian is just as viable as any other variation. Nowadays, it's a very positional and dry way of playing against the Sicilian. A lot of people will play c3 as sort of a way to dampen the attacking ambitions of an aggressive black player. Uh, Sveshnikov is really playing for blood with this uh, c3 Sicilian. Uh, his lines were not uh, basic positional variations. He was getting some very aggressive openings out of this. And, uh, here, the game we're looking at today, this is a game we played against Mark Taimanov, of course, uh, world-class grandmaster his own right. He deserves a lot better fate than being only known for the guy that got beaten 6 nothing by Bobby Fischer. Uh, world-class Grandmaster, of course, he can't help analyze the uh, time and off variations to say. Also, world-class pianist. Uh, if you like uh, classical piano, uh, look up his music on YouTube. You can find a couple of pieces, and he was quite good with the piano. Uh, but e4, c5, c3, d5. This is the move I prefer. The modern main preference seems to be for 906. Um, in my opinion, d5 leads to more un unbalanced positions, so when you're playing in, like, weekend Swisses, like I do, like four or five round tournaments, winning with black is essential. Typically, I'll be one of the higher rateds in the tournament, so a draw with black just puts me behind the winning pace. So it's important to get positions even with black where you have a lot of winning chances you can try to convert on those winning chances. Um, these positions tend to be a bit more dry and technical. If white wants to kill the action in the game, it's much easier to do so. Whereas after d5, um, it's a little bit riskier for black, because white does gain some chance of his own. Uh, but typically, black's able to secure some imbalances and try to do something fun with the game. So that, d5 is my personal preference, but I would say they're of equal value for different reasons. He takes, queen takes. Notice that the queen being developed is fine, because the knight doesn't have c3 available. Uh, if the knight had c3 available, this would be a, a poor move from black. It's d4. Knight c6, modern preferences for this. Uh, this is a very solid line. Knight c6 is a more imbalanced line. This is one of the lines I have in my repertoire as black. Uh, this is what you play with black when you're looking for maximum winning chances. Dxc5, this is a very technical option. Um, Sveshnikov is probably looking to try to bore time off to death. 
Of course, it doesn't really happen here. Knight f3 is standard, and then bishop f5 is sort of a modern theoretical trend. Bishop g4 has been analyzed quite a bit. Um, one of the problems is, after this, the bishop on g4 doesn't make a whole lot of sense anymore. You sort of wish it were on f5 to prevent uh, king c2, because that king is just going to tuck itself away in c2. It's going to be relatively safe there, in some lines. Whereas bishop f5 just immediately cuts out those lines, so it makes it sort of prophylactically pointed directly at dxc5. Um, very interesting. I mean, a modern theory is still doing some work on here. That's another reason why, like, d5 is it, it has a lot less analysis to it right now. Uh, so dxc5, a little bit more technical. Queen takes. Um, without the knight developed on f3, this probably doesn't work as well. Uh, this There's no annoying pin to deal with, so... White can just actually directly develop and try to guard that pawn on c5. I would think black's more likely to just be a full pawn down from this point instead of getting some sort of compensation. So queen x c5 is correct. Knight 3 Again, th when you've played c3, this is sort of a standard way to develop this knight because it's still hopping to aggressive posts. It can hop to c4, it can hop to b5, and take advantage of the fact that the queen's stranded on c5. Uh, the knight, knight is quite good on a3. It's certainly not good at all. E5, this is a little bit loose. Black needs to be developing, so knight of 6 is a little bit better. Knight of 3. Um, and I would say white's a little bit better here. White's got a decent little uh, edge in development. Um, but black is still very much solid. The queens are off the board, so there's not really going to be an attack against the black king anytime soon. Um, I would certainly take white, just because he has a nice edge in uh, development, plus his queen side majority is probably going to be a factor at some point, whereas the black king side majority is less likely to matter. But, uh, interesting position. e5 is a little bit loose. Knight b5, this is a mistake. Bishop, bishop e3 is more effective because it's gaining that development against the black queen. Uh, this is one potential line. This is some somewhat similar to the game, except white actually has a few extra moves in, basically. So, White's already getting a in development. Knight b6 is a threat here. Uh, White's just got very obvious moves to continue with the game. You know, knight gf3 will threaten that xe5. White's just going to continue to uh, steam ahead in development, and that black king is still stuck in the center. So this is a very dangerous position for black. Knight b5 sort of forces the black queen to retreat, which is what he wants to do anyways. E3, b6. This is more or less a decisive positional mistake. Um, a6 has to be played. Uh, this sort of dares white to go ahead on his threats. So bishop c5, notice that if we just retreat b5, this really is a terrible knight now. It has no way back into the game. b4 is a positional threat at this point, but otherwise black's just going to continue to develop with like uh, bishop b7 or bishop b6, or d8, get the queen side develops. So bishop c5 is more or less forced. Um, so white's won the exchange, but this knight in a8 is very much stranded, and black has a very useful lead in development. Um, white, white's pretty much going to be forced to take the repetition here. So um, so b6 is more or less a decisive positional mistake, because it allows white to continue developing on mass. Queen f3, bishop c4 is a little bit more accurate. Staring at this f7 pawn so that uh, black can't be castling queen side just yet. But queen f3 is fine. Castle. So preventing Castle's queenside from black himself. Uh, this is a very, very dangerous position. Rook d8, trying to trade off. Knight c6. This is... It holds on to material, but this allows a decisive bind from white. Uh, black needs to dump the material and try to get some pieces off the board. This is going to be one for white eventually. Um, but still, this was a way to survive. Whereas knight c6. After queen a4, now knight xa7 is... Threatened anyways. Just this black king and the king side pieces are completely stranded. So black's going to be playing without the majority of his pieces, whereas white, knight f3, bishop c4, rook d1, just easy moves to continue to uh, develop and develop the initiative and attack. Uh, black is helpless here. So a6, knight f3, just continues development. Black played f6. If he takes, after queen a7, there's no good response to this attack on the bishop on b7. If the bishop moves, knight g5, the queen can't defend f7 and c6 at the same time. But this is a dead loss position. Bishop x, b6, so the, this sort of reminds me of the Morphe-Duke-against-the-Count game, where white just 
sacrifice a piece to stream ahead in development. Look at these king side pieces. Fish by not FA. Knight on G8. Rook, H8. Rook on H8. The king is stranded on E8. Black is playing without the majority of his pieces. This really isn't being down to material because these pieces aren't involved in the game. There's no way for black to get these pieces in to the game anytime soon. So white's attack is going to succeed mostly by default, just because he has his pieces in the game and black doesn't. So bishop b6, completely appropriate. Just look at the pressure on black's position. These pieces on the king's side are completely not involved. This is, black's completely helpless. Rookie one, simple threats. Simple chess, sim simple threats. When you look at the games of great players and grandmasters, you'll be astounded at how so often the decisive moves are just normal developing moves. You know, white can try to find a way to break through without this rook, but just play simple chess. Get your pieces into the game. So often when you're able to mobilize and your opponent isn't, that means you win. Rookie one finishes mobilization, just sets up unstoppable threats. Bishop c4 hits queen. Knight d5. And queen c8. Queen b3, that threatens bishop f7 and queen e6 mates. And then rook d7 is threatened, and that'll be decisive. This is a losing position. Queen b5, creating unstoppable pressure on the knight on d5, so black sacrifices. Uh, black's still struggling on, but this is uh, white's advantage is actually in material now. Now white's up a pawn, plus he still has this huge edge in mobilization and attack. Knight d4, threatening the queen, the knight, six. This is, this is over. A6 jumping in, and this game's completely over. Knight xg7. The rest of the game can be given without comments. And if the knight takes, I can probably just check. Just move the bishop back. White's two pawns up. A, a brain isn't required here. This is easy technique. So really, the key to this whole game, and this was back when the uh, C3 Sicilian really wasn't a thing. It was so unknown, and Sveshnikov was basically making this theory up by himself. And you can sort of tell from the way Black was handling this. No modern player would think about playing B6 here, because they see the danger of white mobilizing very quickly. But the queen in E7 is sort of a, a bathtub plug stopping up Black's smooth development on the king's side. If not for that queen, you know, the bishop come out quickly, the knight can develop, Black could start getting things moving. But after b6, white's just developing so quickly. And you get to this position here, and this this is already decisive, because in the blink of an eye, this bishop on f8, this knight in g8, this rook in h8, they're just not involved. Whereas all of white's pieces are completely mobilized, and it doesn't matter that white's a piece now. No, he has two pawns for the piece. But even if he didn't, it wouldn't matter, because that edge and mobilization and that attack against Black's completely undeveloped position is what's important. So many of Sveshnikov's games from the 60s and 70s saw stuff like this, where he played the C3 Sicilian actually aggressively, and he got attacking positions like this because the theory was so unknown, and he was creating this out of whole cloth, and it was very difficult for even strong players like Timonov, for instance, to resist a new and aggressive opening weapon like this. So... Great game from, from Sashnikov. We're going to continue our tribute tomorrow. Um, we're going to move on to looking at the advanced variation against the French, which is a personal favorite of mine. Uh, when I was a kid, I played E4 uh, exclusively. And against the French, I chose the advanced strictly based on Sveshnikov's recommendations. So I have a lot of fond memories of the man just based on the advanced French. So uh, I'll see you tomorrow.